Welcome back to the NAEP YouTube site. This is part two of the video about sustainability education, responding to the environmental crisis. Now references to the book are indicated on the slides as chapters and pages. Thank you. Welcome Stephen and Steve uh, back to the NAEP YouTube site for part two, uh, which it promises to be most interesting about their book, which uh, has uh, been published recently. So I do urge you to uh, get hold of it uh, in any way you can. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Steve and Stephen and talk about themselves and, of course, about the book. So we've chosen this opening slide. I suspect you can see the two eyes peering out of that installation which appeared in the courtyard of our university very recently. It's covered in moss and it's a dragon which is based on uh, the carvings which were found on the site where we are actually located uh, dating back to medieval times and uh, the dragon of course is a fearsome creature in, in certainly in European thought uh, but it's also a reminder of biodiversity. There was a time when people weren't certain whether dragons were real or not and uh, the importance of our relationship with nature. And this particular sustainability dragon is covered in moss. And so it has a sort of climate change uh, dimension to it. There's an awful lot we could say about it, uh, but it will accompany us as we uh, uh, share some thoughts about uh, how we can respond to the crisis that we face. Okay, so just to introduce ourselves, I'm Steve Rawlinson. I'm a physical geographer by training. Um, my teaching experience encompassed the primary, secondary and university sectors. For 21 years, I was principal lecturer in geography education at Northumbria University, responsible for training primary teachers, geographical president 2015 to 16. And until recently, I was chair of the, primary, of the editorial board of its journal, Primary Geography. I have a special interest in field work, which is why you're seeing the slide there, and um, sustainability and environmental education. And I'm the other Steve. I'm Steve Scoffham, the one on the right. Uh, I'm an educational author, school atlas consultant, and I worked for many years uh, training primary school teachers uh, at Canterbury Christchurch University, where I'm currently a visiting reader in sustainability and education. And like Steve, I have, I'm a one-time president of the Geographical Association. In part one, um, we looked at how we got to uh, we got to the present crisis situations that we are in, and how education can respond. In this part, we're going to look at how we the approach we've taken in their book and what does the future hold. A little bit of crystal ball gazing, if you like, based on um, some of the reactions, etc., that we've had to the book and our thoughts as we've um, gone around talking about the the, the, the book in it itself. So to the book, to the book, in, in this, we focus on how sustainability education can be introduced to children in the three to 14 age range, spanning all subjects and applicable to a wide range of settings. That was very important when we were setting up how we were going to write the book. Our experience showed us that there was a need for an in-depth guide and critique of sustainability education written not just for teachers, but for also for education students, students in general, school governors, curriculum makers, and indeed policy makers. To achieve this, we've adopted a broad definition of sustainability, embracing many educational movements. We've identified a number of general principles and concepts that underpin the argument, We've set out a wide range of age-related practical teaching ideas. There are over 180 in the book itself. And we've indicated how sustainability education can be developed across a whole school. We certainly don't think we've got all the answers, but we hope that what we offer will provoke debate and changes in approach. So we start with the classroom, and you can see that's at the centre of the diagram. And we want to contextualise what happens in the classroom, particularly when sustainability education is concerned. So if you go around the edges, as it were, starting with the green box, that represents our ideas about 
uh, uh, and what we've covered when we discuss what sustainability can actually mean and what it's all about, and much more than just picking up litter and turning off the lights. The blue box at the top highlights uh, some of the different dimensions of the um, biodiversity crisis uh, and the climate crisis, population growth, uh, social justice and inequalities and so on, all come into play there. On the right, uh, uh, the sustainability education box, that greyish, pink, uh, greyish, blue one, is all about what you do in the classroom, how it's organised, that's where curriculum would come in. But underneath it all, as it were, and at the bottom of the diagram on the purple, are the fundamental narratives, the deeply held assumptions, the beliefs, which are often, which guide our behaviour, but are often so deeply embedded uh, that we don't recognise them on a day to day basis. Uh, there's there's common sense almost, uh, and we don't have to have to uh, foreground them. But actually, when you begin to dig beneath the surface, you realise how important they are. So things are beginning to look a bit complicated already. What happens in those four walls, as it were, of the classroom is uh, uh, impacted in lots of different ways. And sustainability education is a multi-dimensional challenge that requires a multi-dimensional response. One of the key challenges was to identify the overarching ideas, the, the general concepts and principles that could provide a framework for sustainability education and these needed to apply to every area of the curriculum a conceptual underpinning has the advantage of making the silos between subjects more porous and thus making learning more holistic and we're very keen on that word porous to, to, to get rid of this silo mentality that we seem to have got uh, particularly in primary uh, um, we think that the idea of porosity has got a lot going for it when complemented by a commitment to common values, they also have to give the coherence to the wide range of learning experiences found in primary schools. We believe this framework and others like it are, 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 what, like, are one of the girders that will be needed to create the curriculum bridge across the chasm we alluded to in the earlier video. The challenge is to find the mechanism now to put them all together. We decided to go down the road of looking at 12 areas of study to illustrate the approach. And these are indicative of the scope of the terrain of sustainability. Then you may be very familiar with some of the terms that you can see there. Um, one of the things you can start to do is match those titles with the photographs. But it's interesting, isn't it? If you look at that closely, Weather and climate is just one of 12 topics. It's not the topic, it's one of 12. The areas of study all overlap so that you can use a picture more than once. And equally, some areas of study might link to two or three pictures. And this is the message we really do want to get across is the idea of connectivity. Everything is connected. You can't do one without the other. So when it comes to areas of study and the topics within them, we have tried to suggest activities which are age appropriate and which relate to many different areas of the curriculum. It's noteworthy that nearly all of them focus on English. So that's really interesting. Also, we have avoided labelling sustainability as a separate subject, which could be counterproductive and lead to pigeonholing. Again, what we've tried to avoid is putting sustainability into its own silo. In the previous video, we talked about how sustainability education involves different ways of knowing and different ways of making sense of the world around us. Uh, and that's summed up in the mantra, head, hands, heart. And this, in a sense, is something that we can illustrate and we can illustrate in lots of different ways. But uh, the emotional engagement that comes from uh, 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 and is involved in sustainability education, it may be even more important than the knowledge, uh, because it's the emotional engagement which provides the motivation to find out more about the world. This map here is drawn by a, a nine year old and it shows uh, the place uh, which uh, the, the child concerned said it's the fav my favorite place in the whole world 
And it comes from a project which we've been involved with recently, which is called Meaningful Maps, where we've got children to draw maps of places which they treasure in their own area. And we've had some uh, remarkable uh, responses. And what, one of the things which came across was how much their locality mattered to them. We think that this illustrates the idea and the principle that emotional ties really do matter. And the importance here from the sustainability angle is that, put it succinctly, you won't care for something that you don't love. So one of the unique features that we've tried to incorporate throughout the book is that it helps teachers in their planning by incorporating sustainability and environmental issues into the curriculum. But that can be a daunting prospect, especially for those entering the profession whose backgrounds may be in other subject areas. So we try and offer some practical help in addressing this. Um, in developing curriculum organisation, we consider two things in particular, how the topics outlined in the book can be integrated into the curriculum to provide a portrait of sustainable sustainability literacy for pupils of different ages and abilities, and we summarise this in an extensive table of learning outcomes. And secondly, how sustainability education is being approached in a number of different schools. The portraits that we present are drawn from a range of contexts, both in the UK and overseas, and show a variety of approaches being undertaken. You may, for example, pick up the picture at the top right is from Australia. So, what does the future hold? Having, having written the book, having received lots of comments about it, how has our thinking advanced? How, can we look into the future a little bit? Can we do a little bit of crystal ball gazing? Well, I think we can take Mike Berners-Lee's idea of there is no planet B just a little bit further. And we're going to use this particular photograph, which you may well recognise as a very famous photograph. But we've twinned it with a slightly different quotation. So it's important to remember that we're all in this together. Collectively, we have to find new and effective ways to live within the boundaries of this remarkably fragile and lonely planet or face the consequences together. This quote from the Soviet astronaut Alexei Leonov sums up the issues in just a few succinct but very powerful words. And at the present time of international conflict, these words are all the more powerful but being iterated in Russian. Collaboration, cooperation or partnership, it's never been more important. Now, as we move into the future, we're going to need something to guide us. Historically, myths and traditions and stories uh, which encapsulate deep truths about the human condition have served that purpose. But we've now realised that we've got to the point where we are living in a world that is different to the one that we thought we were living in. As the theologian Thomas Berry puts it on, on the screen now, the old story, the account of how we come to be and how we fit in no longer works. We need to devise a new story, new accounts, but we haven't yet uh, been able to uh, invent those yet. What we're trying to do maybe in education as a society at large is to learn how to and find how to re-speak and rewrite the world. And the great thing is that we can all be part of that process of re-speaking and rewriting. It means we've got to focus on the challenges ahead to equip children for an uncertain future. Rewriting involves devising appropriate curricula and learning opportunities. These are exciting moments. Eisenstein there in that quote calls it a sacred, very precious time. And those exciting moments are upon us now and we need to grasp them. Now, scientific accounts of what goes on in the world, how global warming is affecting us and so on, uh, provide us with some wonderful information and they've been absolutely critical. But we need also to recognize the importance of the subjective and spiritual interpretations of the world. And maybe that is the area of focus for the future. There's a picture of the full moon. It's quite difficult to photograph the full moon in East Kent this February. In North American traditions, it's known as the snow moon. Uh, it's also called a hungry moon. 
by some indigenous people. For my wife, who's ethnic Chinese, the significance was that it marks the last day of the Chinese New Year. And for myself, I was about to visit and see something I'd never seen before, the Seven Bore, when the tide sweeps up the River Severn as a great wave, dri driven by the tide, uh, which is itself uh, the result of a full moon. That was a significance for me. So lots and lots of different interpretations of the world, depending on our cultural diversity, depending on the lens that we're looking through when we actually uh, 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 engage with the environment round about us. Now, on an entirely different level, governments have helped to um, try to find a way of encapsulating an approach to what's going on in the world at the moment. And you'll probably be familiar with the su sustainable development goals. What we've done here is to choose a way of putting them together, which we think is essential, where we depend on the biosphere. So life on land and life on water, two uh, key sustainable development goals appear at the bottom. We depend on the planet to support us. The next level uh, provides a, a social and cultural understanding and the top le level, the economy, which enables us to prosper and so on within uh, the planetary limits that we've got. And right at the very top uh, is partnership, uh, the cooperation that Steve uh, was uh, uh, um, mentioning earlier. Now, we don't really have sustainability education featured in the primary curriculum for this country and many other jurisdictions have the same problem. So what we've tried to do is to show what we're doing and how what we're doing chimes with the Sustainable Development Goals. And although the Sustainable Development Goals are imperfect, they do at least provide an internationally agreed framework. And there's something to be said for being pragmatic and saying, well, that's the best we've got at the moment. So what are the key challenges that we've sort of recognised um, in the past year since the book came out and which we want to highlight today. Well, the first one is relating to knowledge, knowledge and skills, etc. The knowledge, skills and enthusiasm of the teacher are obviously quite fundamental. And what we've got to do is make sure that teachers have the confidence as well as the knowledge to help children understand the difficult issues. So that focuses attention very clearly on teacher education and in-service training. Secondly, recognising the interconnected nature of sustainability education and how individual disciplines make a unique contribution to it. I think it would be fair to say that traditional disciplines no longer match current needs as once they did. We recognise the need for fundamental reform to schooling. Thirdly, developing new ideas about how school subjects and timetables are organised is a really, really difficult issue, and we recognise that. But that change in, in mindset needs to come about if we're actually going to address the issues that face us. The question is, how are we going to make it come about? Is there the will to do that? And then third, fourthly, it's about embedding some kind of practical action. The ped what are the pedagogies that are going to be most effective for the future? Practical action is desirable, but it's difficult to organise and potentially risky. Will teachers take it on board? So to finalise, to, to give us your, give you our final slide, um, we, we, we decided on this particular image, which we feel represents possibilities and hope. And that's important because it's easy to be overwhelmed by negative and depressing scenarios um, that we hear every day and which our children face. So this, this image is one which we particularly like because it alludes to the bubbles of good practice that are breaking out both within and beyond the world of education, despite the current curriculum restraints. We, are, we have been quite overwhelmed by the fact that so many people have contacted us and we've been in contact with so many people who are all doing some wonderful, wonderful ideas as they're sharing and they are engaging with wonderful thoughts and ideas about sustainability, but they're all in their own little separate bubble. So one of the key messages of our talk today is the need for these initiatives to coalesce 
into bigger and bigger bu bu bubbles to create a critical mass for educational change. We've put a, quite a few references up there for you, which we hope you'll find of use. And we hope that this talk has resonated with your thinking in some way, and we'd be very delighted to hear your thoughts and comments on our presentations and also the book itself. Thank you. Well, thank you very much indeed, Stephen, Stephen, for a fascinating glimpse uh, into the book that you've uh, recently had published. We're most grateful here. And uh, obviously, if there's any comments you want to put on the video about the book or your thoughts about sustainability uh, on the video, that would be really great, gratefully received because both Stephen, Stephen can see the sort of feedback that they receive, not only on the book, but on the video itself. So without further ado, thank you very much indeed, Stephen Stephen, for uh, uh, telling us all about sustainability. And indeed, uh, the book behind me, uh, on that side, I mean, uh, is well worth uh, a look. And if you can get it, get it in any way you like, if you're at a university library or even by yourself, uh, please do, because it's well worth a read. I can guarantee it because I read it myself. So again, thank you, Stephen Stephen, for a most fascinating video. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.